Okay, uh, welcome to the Monday SITP colloquium. Today, we are very happy to have Joao Panadonis from EPFL Lausanne. And he will be telling us about bootstrapping effective field theories using the S matrix bootstrap, focusing on pions and supergravitons. Uh, go ahead, Joao, floor is over to you. Okay, yeah, thank you very much for this invitation. Yeah, it's uh, very nice to really to talk across across the Atlantic, across nine nine time zones. It's it's quite an experience. So, so yeah, as uh, Hagu said, I will talk about this uh, S matrix bootstrap applications in particular to effective field theories. Okay, so this the there are many applications. We the first one we did was for the Goldson bosons on the flux tube. And today I will talk about uh, pions and supergravity, mostly supergravitons. And there is also work in progress about just photons, the Euler Eisenberg Lagrangian, which uh, should appear soon. Okay, so the, the idea is always the same, but you apply it to different systems. So the, the structure of the talk is pretty simple. I will just explain you what's the problem in supergravity. And then in that context, I will explain the method of S matrix bootstrap. It will be very, yeah, it will be easier to explain in the context of the example. And then hopefully I'll have time at least to briefly explain the application to pions also. Okay, so let me start with a, slightly broader introduction. So this uh, recent work that we've been doing in the S matrix bootstrap really appeared in the context of the conformal bootstrap. And basically this was being very successful and we thought, well, but why not also study massive quantum field theories, not just the conformal ones and um, how to set up a bootstrap problem to do that. And of course, then we ended basically rediscovering the S matrix bootstrap and adding to it a numerical component to make it uh, into a, turn it into an actual algorithm, okay? So, so, but today we're doing a slightly different thing. We're not studying the full quantum field theory per se. We're studying the end point of, uh, an RG flow. So for example, this picture is exactly the right picture for pions where we have uh, some UV quantum field theory like uh, QCD that controls the, the microscopic theory. And then we have a flow that ends up in some free CFT of pions of Goldson bosons. And we want to study the leading interactions controlled by the effective field theory. Okay, so for pions, this will be the right picture. And uh, as I said, at the technical level, we just basically work by analogy between the conformal bootstrap. And I just want to emphasize that in this bootstrap uh, approach, um, it's usual story. We don't study a specific theory, we study physical observables and we just bound the space of physical observables imposing consistency conditions. So one important question is which physical observable should we look at in, a, in each context, okay? So in the conformal bootstrap, the great success comes from analyzing the four point function of local operators, which also exists in massive theories, but that object in massive theory is just too complicated, okay? A four point function, a massive theory is a function of six variables. I don't know what to do with it. It's just too complicated to work with. At least there is no, no concrete ideas on the market. While if I look at scattering amplitudes, then they are also functions of two variables, right? Uh, an energy and a scattering angle. So they have the same level of complexity. So sorry, two to two scattering amplitudes, that's important, as a four point function in the conformal field theory. Okay, so there is a natural map between a technical analogy between these two bootstraps. And there is actually a precise relation if you consider quantum field theory in ADS and take the flat space limit. But okay, this will not be important for today. 
And today we will add uh, a slightly different perspective. So we will go outside the realm of quantum field theory. We will discuss gravitational theories. So we really don't know what the UV is, but we know the IR, we know that we can treat um, we can treat GR as an effective field theory plus higher derivative corrections. And so what we were going to ask is what constraints can we put in these higher derivative corrections if we assume, okay, this is an assumption, we cannot really prove it because we don't have a UV definition of quantum gravity. If we assume basically the same things we can prove in quantum field theory, okay? Lorentz invariance, crossing, NLT, and unitarity. Well, in fact, even in quantum field theory, we cannot prove full analyticity that we will use. Okay, so this is really the analyticity you get in perturbation theory. Sorry, Joe. Okay. Lorentz invariance. So you, since we are doing quantum gravity, there is no strict Lorentz invariance. So what do you mean? I mean asymptotically, right? The oh, S matrix okay. will depend on on Mandelstam invariance. Okay. Right? There's an asymptotic okay. structure of. Of, okay. Uh, asymptotically so flat space. You won't be doing like a, a small metric expansion around flat space or anything. I will just be studying scattering amplitudes, but okay. they will be functions of momenta in a Lorentz invariant way. Okay. Lawrence okay. Invariant. Thanks. Okay. So that's my brief introduction. And if there is any question about the logic, I, I hope it's clear. So so now let's uh, let's be concrete. So the gra the gravitational theory I'm going to study is supergravity, maximal supergravity in ten dimensions, just because well it has direct connection with string theory and it, because maximal supersymmetry helps me uh, to deal with the elicities and all the polarization. Essentially, it reduces everything to a scalar problem. Okay? So in this context, what is the concrete question that I want to study? Well, the concrete question is, uh, I want to study the allowed range of the leading higher derivative corrections to the uh, supergravity effective action. Okay, so here I'm just writing the pure gravitational terms. So I'm neglecting uh, fermions and all, all other terms. So this to just take it as schematically. So the, we know just from supersymmetry that the correction in uh, type two supergravity in, uh, in 10 dimensions starts at R to the four. And there is a param dimensionless parameter that we call alpha, which controls this uh, the size of this coefficient. Okay. And so we want the to six ask, is a typo then the L Planck to the six should be squared no, or something. Because R this is Ricci as dimensions of uh, curvature, one over length square, right? And then it's one over length to the fourth. So this has oh. this is dimension, sorry. This is dimensions of one over length to the eight, and this one over length square. So ah, okay, it's sorry, okay. yes, it's okay. Good, good, good. Uh, okay, so so of course I'm not going to study this at the level of the Lagrangian. I'm going to study this at the level of the scattering amplitudes. So I need to understand how does this appear in scattering amplitudes. Okay. So this appears in scattering amplitudes in a simple way. Sorry, Joe, sorry to interrupt. I guess the R squared yeah. and R cube are absent. That's why I was confused, I guess. Yes, R squared and R cube are absent just by supersymmetry. Okay. I can actually comment on that uh, in a few seconds at the level of the amplitude is, is also easy to understand. Okay, thanks. So, Okay, so this was, if you want, just motivation, but now let me give you the precise definition. So what I will look at, the observable I will look at is the two to two scattering of the graviton multiplet. And uh, because this is maximal supersymmetry, this amplitude is completely fixed 
up to a single scalar function. So there's some prefactor that encodes all the polarization structures that tells you which actual state in the multiplet you are scattering. And then there is one single scalar function, A, which is full in crossing symmetric, okay? And it's gonna be a function of the Mandelstam invariance. So I'll use the standard notation, SPU, for the Lorentz invariant combinations of the um, external momenta. And of course, since the gravitons are massless, uh, this, these three parameters are not independent, they sum to zero. So keep this in mind. I will often write three arguments, but of course, s plus t plus u is zero. Okay, so, and I will explain later, but we will in particular focus on a component. So for example, in type 2b, this will be the actual scattering amplitude of the axidiliton, okay, of the charge scalar, which is the axidiliton which is just s to the four times this crossing symmetric function a. And uh, you can see that if you start expanding this function uh, a, it starts precisely as x squared over t plus s squared over u that correspond to the graviton exchange between these charged scalars. And now the definition of alpha is gonna be the next term, okay? so. So this part here is just supergravity. Okay. If you expand that, it gives it's exactly equal to that. And uh, and the first correction is this uh, um, constant. Okay. So alpha is defined by this equation. So if you want, yeah, maybe I can explain it here. So so you see, supergravity starts as one over STU for this function a. And then you would have to write other things in, so, so here, let's say here, you could think that there are things in between, right? You change, you're jumping uh, dimension by six. But what can you write? You could write something like one over st plus one over su plus one over tu, right? That will be crossing symmetric and would be the next dimension. That will be the contribution of R square if you want. Uh, yeah, but you can check that this uh, basically sums to zero under st plus u equals zero. And the, and the next term, and the next term, one over s, one over t plus one over u, this you could think, why, why don't I have that? That should be like r cube. But if you have that, you see the residue of the one over t pole is now s to the fourth. So this would correspond to the exchange of a spin four massless particle, which you don't have in supergravity. So this is also, so this, this doesn't, that's why at the level of the amplitude, the first thing you can write after one over STU is a constant. And that's a amplitude way of seeing that the correction starts at order r to the four. Okay. Okay, so now the question is what value can I ask a question? Please, please go ahead. Uh, so, yeah, I'm confused by the uh, by the argument because uh, don't I change the cubic uh, the cubic vertex by adding r squared and r cube terms? Yes. So but, I, but still, it would I, contribute. It would contribute to the amplitude, right? It would or would not? I mean, the, the cubic vertex enters here, no? Right. Yeah, and exactly. So, so I'm it's... asking how come you, it's, it's, your argument seems to be very powerful. You are saying I can just, I cannot have, a, yeah, I guess I didn't understand. You are, if I add R squared and R cubed term, then the cubic vertex changes but somehow you are saying the amplitude uh, the amplitude will not change so what i'm saying is that these two terms let me let me circle them again these two terms that had the right crossing symmetry properties and the right dimension 
to correspond to R square and R cube terms. Uh, they, so the first one just vanishes on shell, S plus C plus U equals zero. And the second one cannot be present because it would correspond to the exchange of spin four massless particles. So the so, state- But you I should be relying, Joe, you should be relying on supersymmetry in some way here, right? Is it because you're saying that like the- Yeah, because super the, the form of amplitude is the same for like graviton and for this oxydiloton, right? I mean, that's exactly. what's special. Exactly, because supersymmetry is what tells me that the full amplitude takes this form with a scalar crossing symmetry form times an overall free factor. Because otherwise I didn't have to use crossing symmetry here, right? Because this amplitude is just, it's not, it's an amplitude for charge scalar. So it's not fully crossing symmetric, but supersymmetry tells me that it's actually full crossing symmetric times just S to the four. Yeah, supersymmetry is, is being used for this. Oh, part. okay, okay, thanks. Yeah, this clarifies. Okay. Okay, so let me continue then. So, um, so the question is, uh, what's the allowed range? And uh, it's good to go to the theories we know and see what is the realized range in the theories we know. Okay. So we know super string theory that is maximal supersymmetric. It's a particular UV completion of supergravity. And you can look either at type 2b or type 2a. So in type 2b, this parameter alpha is a specific special function, this non-holomorphic Eisenstein series of the complexified string coupling. Okay. And so I plotted it here. You can see, well, plot is not very obvious, but you can see that the minimum is at this point, at this corner of the uh, fundamental domain of the of tau and the value that it takes the minimum value that alpha takes in type 2b is 0. Point, approximately 0. 0.14 so in type 2a the answer is simpler so you only have three level and one loop contributions to alpha and okay you plot here the function again the minimum is 0. 0.14 so these are not exactly the same number, but they are very close together. And uh, well, one explanation for that is that actually the result in type 2b has the same perturbative expansion as, uh, as type 2a, but on top of that has some instanton corrections, which turn out to be small even at this strong coupling point, okay? So, so the status is that in string theory, not all alphas are positive, the only alphas that are positive are from 0 0.14 to infinity, okay? Greater than 0 0.14. Now, another uh, thing we- Can I ask it again? Uh, yes, do, uh, uh, do, is there a simple reason for that? For, uh, for this bound? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, like what happens if I, I try to make alphas- well, that's, if you want, that's the purpose of the talk, but uh, if you're not satisfied with our, just uh, we can discuss again, but the okay. answer to that question but, is- but I, I imagine you give a field theory answer to that. I'm, I'm, ask, I'm curious, what's the string theory answer? Well, in, in string theory, you have no choice. This is, this is some specific function of the, of the couple of the string um, coupling. Okay. I see, okay. I don't think you have a choice. Uh-huh. Although, although you could ask about compactifications and there would be lots of choices of the analog and lower dimensions, right? Yes, yes, that's a very good question. It's, uh, it's future work indeed to ask what happens in lower dimensions. Yes, it's a very good question, yeah. Okay, okay, thanks. Okay, so, so another thing we know about this alpha is that it has to be positive. Okay, so this is easy to prove. Well, you have to assume some analyticity and the usual uh, decay at infinity, not, not too fast decay at infinity, not too fast growth at infinity, such that this dispersive formula uh, is true. But this is the usual story that you can write some effective field theory coefficients 
as a dispersive integral over the forward scattering amplitude. And therefore, it's uh, obviously positive. You could worry that this will be uh, IR divergent because there's this ds over s to the fifth. But uh, I mean, we can compute uh, in one loop in the effective field theory or even using unitarity equivalently. And uh, this imaginary part also starts at order s to the fifth. So this is completely IR finite and it's a, it's a finite uh, dispersive formula. So the status is this one, okay? So if you like this picture, so there is something which is completely forbidden by a simple dispersive formula, which is negative alpha, okay? We can call it the desert. There is something which exists in string theory. It's realized, so we can call it garden. And there is something we don't know. We cannot exclude uh, by an easy argument but uh, it's not realized in string theory, so that's a question. What uh, is this uh, consistent or not with, um, with basic principles of the S matrix bootstrap? Okay. Sorry, can so I that's just, the can I, Joao, sorry, can I just interject? I wanted to point out that swamps exist in nature. <laughs> anyway, I, just, I mean, this is kind of a, a joke, but I don't think the term, you know, UV sensitivity or dangerous relevance or whatever needs to be rebranded. Um, so uh, just saying, it's what uh, actually it, exists. <laughs> it shows the, the ignorance of biology of theoretical physicists that uh, you think we should, we should do better. I agree, I agree. <laughs> OK. But I think, but OK, I agree. But uh, the point here is that I think this is a very concrete test to this idea that what is consistent is realized in string theory. Is there something beyond that or not? Okay. And here we can at least test that just the basic principles that we usually assume about the S matrix can rule out this little interval that is left. Great, thanks. <laughs> okay. So I'm that's the uh, question. Question, sorry. One, one. Is there also an upper bound on alpha? No, as you, as you can see here in string theory, uh, actually, the alpha goes to infinity at uh, at weak coupling. When when, for example, you can see here when this string goes to zero, alpha goes to infinity. Mm. Because okay. you see, uh, alpha was defined measured in Planck units. Okay, so I, since I'm doing everything non-perturbatively, understood. I'm okay. measuring constants in Planck units. Okay, so that's, that's thank you. Why. Okay. So, so that's where this S matrix bootstrap enters and, uh, and it's gonna be numerical because we don't know how to implement all these principles analytically. So, uh, so I'll just explain uh, the, the algorithm, okay? So this basic algorithm, we, we proposed it already some time ago, originally it was for massive theories, but the generalization to massless is, uh, is simple. And well, essentially there's, three steps. So one step, we just write an ansatz that satisfies all these properties uh, automat exactly. Okay. So this we can do, I will explain you how. And then the, the non-trivial constraint that we cannot impose analytically is unitarity. Okay. So unitarity, we will have to take our ansatz, compute the partial waves, and then impose unitarity partial wave by partial wave. This we don't know how to do analytically. And, uh, and of course, at the end, we minimize uh, a linear observable. In this case, we will just minimize alpha. We want to know the, the lower bound of alpha. So let me just give you a small qualification on this algorithm. So there's going to be two important parameters. One parameter is going to be this n, is the number of variables that we put in our ansatz. So our ansatz is some, if you want some polynomial, and if you increase the degree of the polynomial approximation, you explore more and more space. So we want to send this parameter to infinity at the end of the calculation. Another important parameter is L. Again, we want to impose unitarity for all partial waves of all spins, but the computer cannot do that. So we impose up to some capital L and then we want to send this parameter to infinity. Okay. 
So that means that there is a fourth step in the algorithm, which is to extrapolate. We have to extrapolate these two cutoffs to infinity when we do the numerical computation. Okay. okay, so that's the logic. Now I will explain you one, two, three, four. Uh, well, one and two, three and four is mostly results. I will explain you one and two uh, slowly. Well, more or less. So one, this is the answer. <laughs> so what is the trick? Uh, well, it's, uh, it's indeed very simple. So firstly, let me just uh, explain uh, the basic idea. So here you see a polynomial in these variables, rho s, rho t, rho u, raised to the power abc, and we just truncate the, the degree of the polynomial to n, okay? So these variables are just some map of the cut plane. So you take the S plane minus the cut from zero to infinity and you map it to the unit disk. Okay. There's a, we use this explicit map. And, um, and therefore a function that was analytic in the cut plane is analytic in the disk, but functions analytic in a disk, they have a conversion Taylor expansion. Okay. Notice that we use crossing symmetry. So we write three variables, rho s, rho t, rho u. But of course, then when we evaluate this amplitude, we evaluate it in the physical submanifold s plus t plus u equals zero, okay? So that's the way we obtain in one shot analyticity uh, and crossing symmetry. Crossing is just permutation invariance, right, in STM. So in this, in this, for this particular problem, we add here this uh, factor, which is just an explicit polynomial, because when, when S goes to infinity, rho goes to minus one. So this makes this ansatz uh, go like one over STU, like the sugra. And that's important so that you have decay at infinity. Yeah, this shouldn't grow too fast because it's already multiplied by s to the four. Okay, so it's some, not too important, but it's uh, it's um, it's important in practice. And uh, yeah, and then this prime. Uh, well, I can explain. There are some terms we can remove because, of course, we can use this condition. If you turn, if you transform it into these rows it becomes some polynomial condition. So you can eliminate some terms using this polynomial condition. And, uh, and we also eliminate other terms such that the, the large energy behavior of the partial waves, the large energy behavior of, the, of every partial wave uh, is not growing. So, so that it's compatible with unitary. Those are a bit technical details. I can explain more if someone is interested, but. Uh. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, so did you say that you, you, you fix the UV behavior to be the same as sugar or it's not as simple as that? No, it's not, it's not fixed to be the same. Well, when N is truncated, um, this first product here indeed goes like one over STU like this. And this goes to some constant, right? Because rho is just going to minus one. Um, so in that sense, the big bracket goes at large. If you take all variables large, ST and U going to infinity, it goes like some constant divided by STU. Yes, this answer behaves like that. But you are saying that's not too limiting. No. I shouldn't be worried about that. No, our experience actually is that uh, as long as you're able to obey unitarity at high energy. So if you, if you are not careful and your answer starts to grow with high energy, then when you move to partial waves, partial waves grow at high energies. And when you impose unitarity, you basically kill your answers entirely. So that's the only practical worry. As long as you have something that survives projection to partial waves, um, we never found low energy bounds that actually depended on the high energy behavior of the amplitude. 
this is the experience so far with this method and many problems. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, so this is the answer. Now I should compute, I should impose unitarity. So it turns out that unitarity of the full of the full uh, two to two super graviton scattering is equivalent to unitarity of this scalar amplitude that I defined T. Okay, so that's why I've been always looking at T. And the argument is, is shown here. So the point is that you, you want to, I mean, unitarity for this amplitude is something like that. And uh, of course, here in this cut, you have to sum over all intermediate states in the multiplet. But this prefactor, this R prefactor of the super amplitude, has this property that if you sum over two particle intermediate polarizations, it reproduces the same factor times just s to the four. And uh, therefore, you see that. For the amplitude A, you get that, and well, T was S squared times A, so that just gives you the standard unitarity for T. Okay, it just gives you that, well, something, well, you, you, it gives you something like, uh, um, like this T greater or equal than the phase space integral of T, T, T. Okay which is the standard unitarity for T. So we'll just take T and decompose it into partial waves. So, and then each partial wave has to be less than one, less or equal to one. So this is, this is okay, this is some formula here. You don't have to see the details, but you just take your T, move to S and scattering angle. So maybe I should write that. So this X is cosine theta is the scattering angle and you integrate over the scattering angle against the Gegenbauer polynomial in, in 10 dimensions and that gives you your partial your partial amplitude and the partial amplitude has to be uh, less than one because it's a probability of two gravitons going to two gravitons so that can only can at most be one okay and then I emphasize we have to impose these to all spins. So we, we go up to some capital L and for all S. And so here for all S, we also have to do some grid numerically that covers many values of S from zero to infinity. But here the extrapolation is a bit, it's more under control. We do a very dense grid and we try two grids and basically nothing changes. So here the extrapolation is rather under control while in L and N, we, I will show you in more detail. And in fact, to accelerate convergence, actually this is only done in the V2 of the paper that will appear this week. To accelerate convergence, we, we also impose that forward, imaginary part of the forward amplitude is positive. So, so you should, I mean, this is not an independent condition. So if you impose unitarity of all partial waves or all spin, then this follows. But since we truncate in spin, then this becomes an independent condition and it's useful to accelerate conversions to impose it independently. Okay, so that's step number two. I just want to emphasize that uh, if I put a square here, this is a quadratic constraint on the ansatz, right? Because these SLs are linear in the amplitude and the square is bounded. So it's a quadratic constraint. So now I can Sorry, just- Joao, I have a naive question. In this forward limit, are there some subtleties because you have massless particles like sending T to zero? Can there be divergences in this or? The... No, the, the residue of the t equals zero pole is still the same as in supergravity because that's the, the massless uh, graviton exchange. Then you, you have, you have uh, logs of t, logs of minus t, yeah? you have cuts mm -hmm. all the way to t equals zero, mm -hmm. but they are multiplied by uh, polynomials. You see, it's, it's a bit like uh, I was showing you here, Sorry, where was that? 
here, right? This imaginary part at t equals zero goes like s to the fifth. So it means that t goes like, like s to the fifth times log s. Mm -hmm. So, so you, are, you have enough powers times log such that the limit is, is finite. Okay. It's the real part, I guess, which is not necessarily finite or? of t in the forward limit. Well, that, that is the divergence of the graviton pole. I see. That, that, that is the real part. OK, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah. I think I understand. Thanks. Okay, so that's the that's already the result. So the problem that I explained is a problem of minimizing uh, a minimization problem with quadratic constraints. So it can be solved with the the solver STPB that uh, David Simons often developed for the conformal bootstrap. And here I'm showing you what we find as a function of L and for different values of N, okay? So I recall that N, um, N here is the number of uh, variables in the, in the ansatz. So as N increases, there, are, there is more freedom. So uh, it's natural that we, we can realize a smaller minima, okay? We're minimizing alpha. And as L increases, we, we put more constraints, so it's harder to get a minimum, okay? So for fixed N, the minimum increases as you increase L. Okay, so what we are going to do is, you already seen these curves that as you go to very high L, so here we went up to 244, I believe, and uh, becomes a big plateau. So, so that plateau we take as the limit as L goes to infinity. So the extrapolation to large L is relatively obvious in this picture. And then we will extrapolate to infinite N. So this is, I show you here. So to L equal infinity, we extrapolate and we, I mean, we estimate the error by doing different fits, taking different sets of points when we do the fit like we one over L uh, inverse powers of L. And so you, you can see here uh, error bars in for every fixed L, sorry, for fixed N. For every N, we extrapolate to N equals to L equals infinity. That's a point. And then we extrapolate to N equals infinity. So it's like two extrapolations, right? And with these error bars, we can extrapolate and estimate also the error. And now with the, well, as you will see in V2 that will appear this week, the current estimate is this 0 0.13 plus or minus 0 0.02. So the, well, it just happens that in this very hard numerics at the end, we get a bound compatible with the string theory, compatible with the fact that everything that is compatible with, that, with the axioms of S matrix is realized in string theory. And in particular that the bound is saturated by strongly coupled string theory. Okay, but now, <clears throat> sorry. A any question about uh, this? This is the, the main result if you want. Sorry, I, I missed something silly. You say strongly coupled string theory. Where, where was the coupling in string? Theory? Oh, it was because you were sent to tau equals i or whatever. Yeah, I, never mind. I understand. I understand. Yeah, exactly that. Thing. Okay, sorry, sorry. I just forgot. I forgot. Thanks. So the string theory results are above this bound. You were like zero point thirteen eight something and zero point fourteen. Yeah, there is like theory, a tiny window where string theory says, but string, what string theory, theory also doesn't covers, realize. Covers all of this. This could be string theory starting from 0 0.14. Actually, right. that's, that's, that's the next slide. There is a picture to help on that. So the blue is realized in string theory. 
right? You see here from 0 0.14 to infinity. Mm -hmm. And with our numerics for different ends, we realized like this value, this value, all these values. And then the extrapolation came to this band of the allowed region for the minimum. And uh, well, yes. this we already knew that this was forbidden. Right. Okay. So sure. that's, the, that's the status. I mean, of course, it would be great to increase our numerical precision. And actually, what I think would be really great would be to improve this dual argument so that you, you can exclude the theories from the other side. OK, that I, I can comment on that. So um, sorry, what do you mean by exclude the theories from the other side? Which side? So, okay, I can say that now. I had that in the conclusions, but it's okay. So here, so when you have this prob this optimization problems, uh, there's usual a primal formulation and a dual formulation. The primal formulation, you basically uh, con construct better and better approximations of allowed solutions. Okay? So this is what we are doing. We increase the number of parameters and we build an S matrix with a smaller and smaller alpha until we see that it's saturating at some minimum. There is also the dual problem where you construct dual approximations, like dual functionals that exclude different values of alpha. So, so it would be like finding another way of excluding this region and then improving the numerics and excluding this region. This is what you see in the conformal bootstrap, right? As you increase numerical precision in the conformal bootstrap, you exclude a bigger region. Here we're doing the primal, so we, as we allow more, okay? But there is also, at least in two dimensions, there's already some papers by, uh, by Pedro, Andrea and Alexandre on setting up a dual S matrix bootstrap, but we still don't know how to do it in higher dimensions, but there is some, some work in progress. So that, that's what I mean. Sorry, I always have this question. Uh, how allowed is this allowed region? Like, how am I sure that you have checked all constraints? I guess the best answer is this picture. So it's true, we don't check all constraints. So could be that if we increase L to 500, all these flat curves shoot up and then actually this was not allowed. But uh, that's not our experience. We see these plateaus. We think that indeed uh, this, this, uh, even if we increased L to infinity, these plateaus would not uh, shoot up. And that they would just- Well, I meant more up. like looking at high, the other amplitudes, say two to four, a higher point. Could, ah, could they sure. put, put extra constraints? Sure, that sure. If you put more constraints then in principle, you could, um, yeah, that's, that's, not, uh, that's not guaranteed then. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's not guaranteed, but- um, I'm not sure exactly how to ask this question. So maybe you can interpret it and answer whatever is a reasonable question. But like, it seems like the unitarity constraint depends a lot on the very large high energy behavior of the amplitude. And it seems like the high energy behavior also like depends a lot on your ansatz. And I'm wondering whether like there's a way of checking whether um, like looking at what regions in S are driving your constraints in the final answer somehow, or figuring out whether the high energy behavior of the amplitude is, whether, whether the ansatz is a good one or? Um, yeah, so that, that actually I, I can show you, this is what I was going to show you next. For example, you can look at the sum rule. How is this sum rule satisfied, right? So this, I, I said alpha was given by this integral of the imaginary part. So how, how is this satisfied? And I'm showing you a picture of what we get numerically for several ends. 
and uh, and you see that the sum rule basically satisfy all, all, all the, what contributes to the integral is uh, low energy, I mean, it's order uh, Planck scale. It's uh, this decays fast at infinity. Um, then you see a characteristic peak, which uh, is really is associated with a resonance in the, in the scalar sector. Um, so more generally to answer your question, yeah, as I said before, um, well, that is one, it's important that our ansatz, it's, um, well, even if you change this pre-factor, will always be uh, polynomially bounded the way we write this Taylor series. Well, so polynomially bounded with, does it depend on the um, N or? No. No, it will not depend oh, on. The no, 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 no. Right. Right. And uh, and so I think what's happening is that in this class of ansatz, if you then impose unitarity in all partial waves, then uh, you already have fixed the the, the high energy behavior cannot be. Uh, right. Uh, like it's at most. You say even without that factor, it's at most like s to the fifth or something, right? The so it, it, it's like so, I don't think that so we know that in two dimensions where we have analytic control, we know that if we allow like an essential singularity at s equals infinity, we cannot derive any bound. So if you allow that, indeed, that will spoil everything because then, I mean, basically the, comp the analytic functions can just grow in that direction and, uh, and you cannot bound anything. Mm -hmm. But uh, but as soon as you as you remove that and our ansatz by construction does not allow an essential singularity, then uh, I think it's not so sensitive to that. That's what we observe numerically. Yeah. I see. So if you remove those prefactors of the prefactors, one one minus rho squared or whatever it was, that yeah, that doesn't change the answers too much. Yeah, the, the, it just becomes difficult to then satisfy unitarity at high energy. I, I didn't emphasize, but if you look here, you you have you have this amplitude t that was already had a factor of one over one over s to the sorry s to the fourth, and then there is another x cube here just from kinematics in ten dimensions, but this thing has to be bounded. So you see you you really have to make the, the amplitude to have the, the polynomial conspire such that uh, none of these partial waves grows at high energy. And that's, that's why we put those factors to make it easier to implement that. But yeah, even with those factors, we have to impose many constraints to, to solve that. That's part of this prime, this this prime that I have here is these high energy constraints that we have to impose by hand. Otherwise, uh, the numerics will just, uh, yeah, will just fail because when you go to degree that high S, you always violate unitarity. I see. Okay, thank you. Uh, you're welcome, thanks. Thanks for the question. Okay, so. Yeah, I'm extremely, no, it's good. You, you're asking questions, but uh, not sure how much I will say about pi and, but okay, maybe that's not important. So, so I just, I was here. I want to emphasize that you, you actually match, you see that the numerics are trying to converge to this unitarity saturation. So this, this value that is predicted from uh, one loop effective field theory um, is also predicted just by unitarity because the production of gravitons starts at a higher order. So this, this first term is just a saturation of unitarity in the two to two sector. And you see that uh, as you increase N, you know what happened here? Yeah, as you increase N to N equals 24, you see it's getting better. You also see something else. You see that the peak was much higher at N equal 19 and then it came down. And that's because as you increase the degree of the polynomial, we observe that some resonances appear, okay? And the resonance is a zero that enters 
the complex plane, the physical sheet from the cut. And when the residue enters, it forms a very sharp resonance, but then it converts it to some fixed value in the complex plane and the resonance is broader. So I can show you here the resonance plot. So if you plot the real part of the phase shift in the spin zero channel, you see that actually here, you see that the resonance entered between n equals 20 and 21. Okay, before there was no resonance, but as soon as the degree of the point is sufficiently high, the ansatz are free them to put in this resonance. And that improves, I mean, that minimizes alpha. So it puts it there. And then as n increases, it starts to converge to a specific width, okay? So this scalar resonance in graviton scattering has actually recently been termed graviball. It was found in well, related analysis in, in four dimensions, actually, of unitarization of graviton scattering in this paper. So it's funny that we also find it in 10 dimensions um, in supergravity. And I'm not showing you because they are not very stable, but we observe resonances in many spins. We observe many resonances uh, in this amplitude. So this amplitude is actually very complicated uh, and uh, as a complicated analytic structure. And um, there's a slow convergence. So we, we, we don't know where these resonances are gonna end up in the extrapolation limit. Okay, so before moving to pions in the last few minutes, let me just then give you some comments on the future work on that. So, uh, Eva already mentioned, if I work in lower dimensions, then uh, there's even more parameters. The, the compactification radius uh, will affect this alpha. So it would be interesting to understand that. I think even more interesting is gonna be to do it in M theory because there there's no free parameters. So M theory only allows one value of alpha. What, I mean, is this gonna be is the S matrix bootstrap give something like that? Or that, that would be very, very surprising that would, that uh, the S matrix bootstrap would only be compatible with a specific value of alpha. But I, we, are, uh, we are preparing the, the code to, to run that, that problem. And another thing that I think would be interesting is uh, if we input some inelasticity, right? So here we only started two to two but we know that really at high energies, even, it to, even two to two produces black holes and therefore it will be very inelastic. So the, the exclusive process two to two will be very suppressed by the black hole entropy. So we could try to input by hand some model of inelasticity and see if that affects the, the bounds on alpha. And of course, we could look at higher other Wilson coefficients, the next Wilson coefficients in string theory, uh, many of these things are known and, uh, and we could analyze like two dimensional parameter space, not just one, one coefficient. And uh, of course, it would also be very interesting to do the case without supersymmetry. So that will involve some technical work with, uh, with polarizations. And, uh, and it's basically a generalization of what we did in four dimensions in this paper for spinning scattering amplitudes. But here it's better to do it above four dimensions to avoid uh, the famous IR divergences of gravity in four dimensions, which well make the S matrix ill defined. So it's hard to do non-perturbative S matrix bootstrap with, with that S matrix. Okay, so this is what I wanted to, to say about gravity. If you have some urgent question, I can hear, and then maybe in five minutes, I show you the plot of the pions and I can answer more questions if you are interested. Joe, I have a question about, again, about the Sanzat, sorry. So at least if the particles are massive, we have multi like four particle cut, eight particle cut, et cetera. Does the your ansatz include those other cuts? Like, so so here all the branch points would start from s equals zero, but um, yeah. but it's not very important. To, the important point is is this picture. I mean, whatever you have on on the cut here is mapped here to the boundary of the disk. So we are completely agnostic about uh, about that. 
Mm -hmm. But does that mean that the function that I get would be a good function in an actual theory? Like, like the, for, from the point of view of the bounds, it seems fine. Uh, So if you have branch points, okay, this is massless, so you, you won't have, but if you if it was massive, you would have higher particle yeah. thresholds. Then you would have branch points uh, here, right? Along the, the boundary of the disk. Yeah. Actually accumulating at infinity, which, which would make, if you want this Taylor expansion, uh, harder to converge because, well, you have lots of singularities just at the boundary. It would still converge inside, but at the boundary, it would make it harder to converge. Mm -hmm. um, so indeed, you would, uh, you would worry about the convergence of these ansatz. I mean, the way it works is that, uh, the way I think of it is that we are basically evaluating it slightly above slightly interior, and that's where we're imposing unitarity. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that's how um, we still converge. But, okay. uh, but I, I think this, this point is not, um, this point is not fully understood from first principles. It's basically numerically, we observe that this type of ansatz converges. But a priori, I think that is a real worry that if you had all these branch points, how come this Taylor series is going to convert? Okay, okay, thanks. Yeah, that's another reason why I think that it's really important now to develop the dual methods so that we, we approach the bounds from the other side. Yeah. Sorry, Joel, can I ask a sort of a different question? I sure. I found the M theory example interesting for the reason you said, but then, you know, as, as we know, we can get there from a strong coupling limit of type two. Um, so you already had a plot of, of um, the type two situation as a function of, I guess in type two B it was tau, um, and in type two A it would be just the mm -hmm. Dillard. Yeah, so what, I mean, somehow you're already handling strong coupling, order one coupling. Um, and so if you can handle strong coupling, then you could handle M theory by taking the limit of 2A, right? Uh, but no, but I mean, at the level, maybe it's because you, you will be measuring alpha in units of the 11 dimensional Planck mass. And uh, and now in that in those units alpha is really a pure number. Yeah, I mean I think the problem is really qualitatively different from the asymmetric perspective because in ten D you have a big region of allowed space. There's a minimum, but the, and in eleven D you just have one number. I think it's a uh, well, so so if um, if I try and insist on taking this limit, um, are you saying it's it's uh, too quick to try and follow this this quartic coupling through that? It's not uh, as simple as just following the quartic coupling. That is, is it not uh, protected? I mean, quartic and the curvature. Yeah, first of all, we don't have an S matrix for all values of the coupling. Right, we, we just have the minimum, but um, but you say if we fixed it. Well, I'm just saying if you could follow the quartic coupling, I'm not quite clear on why you can't just, why the M theory case shouldn't appear as the limit of the 2A case if everything is protected. But, but I think it would be, because the circle decompactifies, right? Yes, uh, yes, yes. So, so, so I think it's like like they don't include say KK modes, right? So it's roughly yeah, speaking yeah. would be equivalent to the fact that KK modes also consistently scatter, right? Uh, I mean, that's it. Some of right, right. right. You have to, I agree. I agree. You have to be able to include it's asymptotic states. You have to include asymptotic states from those, and so you're getting new constraints from that. I guess is what you're saying. 
Yeah, so, so, so your hope, so somehow the hope is that indeed by adding a circle's worth of, of these um, of these KK modes, uh, you get extremely strong constraint, extremely strengthened constraints. Honestly, if you ask me just from S matrix bootstrap, I, I don't think it's going to work because we never found such a drastic change moving dimension, qualitative change. But uh, we will try and uh, we will tell you. Okay, I, thanks. I would thanks. be surprised. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, so yeah, just very briefly, since I, since I put it in the abstract, I was more optimistic. So I will just tell you what happens in uh, in 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 pions, okay? I will consider the case of massless pions, so that is exact. Uh, there are exact Goldson bosons of chiral symmetry breaking, and you can write this chiral Lagrangian. Well, it's not very important. I will already explain you in terms of the amplitude. What matters is that I will study uh, pi pi scattering. Okay, just by isospin symmetry, the amplitude will have this structure where this A of ST and U is TU symmetric. So that's crossing symmetry. And then I can compute this using the chiral Lagrangian at low energies. Okay, so it starts as S over F pi square. That comes from the two derivative term. And then the four derivative terms, there's two two low energy constants, usually called L1 and L2, which at the level of the amplitude, I will just call alpha and beta, because these are some specific choice for the scheme to define these constants. So this is very similar to the case of gravity. There is one important qualitative difference is that here, the one loop logs enter at the same order as these leading Wilson coefficients. Therefore, you really have to choose a scheme. You have to choose which argument you put here in the log. So we define the logs with f pi, and that's the way to define alpha and beta. Okay. And okay, I will uh, immediately show you the results for the allowed space of alpha and beta. And uh, here it is. So n max is what we were calling n before. So you see, as you increase n max, the allowed range is increasing and it's converging to some, to some smooth curve. And uh, well, the only things I want to emphasize is that, well, in this scale, which is one over four pi squared, it's the natural scale from naive dimensional analysis for this one loop, um, for this four derivative uh, uh, Wilson coefficient, you see that this is a order one correction to the naive bounds that I put here in dashed line that you can see in these papers that you can derive if you forget about the logs just from uh, dispersion relations um, that you, if you think you're doing like three level dispersion relation. And another point is that QCD, so the values estimated for QCD for these constants uh, appears relatively close to the boundary but not at the boundary. And indeed, we observe that the physics at the boundary is never quite like QCD. And there's some QCD features on the left and some other QCD features on the right. So yeah, in view of the time, I will not show you this because this is just some the same algorithm to this problem. I will just show you this phase shift. So if you go along the boundary, you will find this phase shift. And uh, let me just emphasize that. So on one side of the boundary, well, let me just show you here. So there's two sides of the boundary. One, one here, yellow part of the boundary, oops. And one blue part of the boundary. And those two sides are different. So on the yellow side, you will have a row resonance so you have good phase shifts for the isospin one and spin one. And on the blue part of the boundary, you have a sigma resonance. So you have good phase shifts for the even spin partial waves. Okay, so this is, this is what's shown here. But uh, 
So I'm going super fast. If you have questions, I, I can give you more detail, but I don't want to go too much over time. So let me, let me just state it like that. And, uh, and let me just end with my, with my final comments. So this I already explained, answering a question around Merdat. So uh, there's two formulations, the primal and the dual. So it would be very useful to have a dual. So there are some work in progress that uh, should, uh, should help on this. There's been a lot of recent work which you can think of it as a dual formulation, which might also be applicable to this problem, although it requires the, treat the proper treatment of the branch cut all the way to zero. And so far these methods, uh, they basically only take into account the linear unitarity, okay? So they don't take into account that the imaginary part is greater than F squ than square, but just the linear part that it's positive. So it's unclear how much you can get from linear unitarity compared to what we are doing, the full nonlinear unitarity. And the final thing that I just want to mention is if you're doing quantum field theory like the pions, it would be nice if not just when you do S matrix bootstrap, you don't input only IR information about pi pi scattering, but you also input some UV information that you know that this comes from QCV or some UV CFT. And so recently we made some progress in that. So you can also improve your S matrix bootstrap to include form factors and spectral densities of local operators to have access to UV quantities. And in particular in 4D, what we're doing now is to implement the dilaton scattering amplitudes of komagorsky schwimmer for the, for the A theorem so that we can access the A anomaly of the UV CFT together with the low energy scattering amplitudes. So this is, uh, I think, something that could change qualitatively the picture because so far how can, you cannot really find an island in quantum field theory because you can always deform the theory by adding some massive stuff and that almost doesn't change the S matrix at low energies. But if you, in the same problem, you also fix the A anomaly of the UVCFT, then uh, you're no longer allowed to have massive matter, right? So, so that's, I, I don't know, I'm optimistic that that will uh, give more constraining power to the S matrix bootstrap. Okay, and let me stop here. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Joao. Thanks a lot for the very nice talk. Yeah. I guess it's late for you. Do you have time for some questions and discussion yeah, now? Yeah, sure. okay. sure. it's, it's only nine o'clock, it's okay. Okay. <laughs> Go for it, guys. Anyone who has a question, just ask. What about this gravibow kick? Uh, like you had some recent paper that's well, identified in somewhat semi-classical way or what, what is the status? Like, do we know anything about this gravibow? Is it something real? Yeah, so this, uh, this paper that I cited here, basically what they do, yeah, so, well, Diego Blas, you probably know, right? He's yeah. cosmologist or some CFT person, but uh, these other two, I think, are uh, QCD people, like uh, this dispersion relation people for pion physics, for uh, adronic physics. So there, so they applied this technique, which is um, well, sometimes called the inverse amplitude method. Okay, some unitarization of amplitude. So if you, if I give you a three-level amplitude, it's not unitary, but basic. Well, essentially, what you can do is you compute the phase shift from that, and then you put the phase shift in the exponent so that it becomes unitary in that sense. More or less, that that's one approximation to the amplitude. So if you do that, then you can look at, uh, at the full um, phase shift, well, for example, here, and you will see 
that uh, if it crosses pi over two, you identify it as a resonance or you will see a zero in the complex plane. So this is what they did for some version of graviton scattering in four dimensions. And, uh, and they observed this gravity ball that there was a resonance in the scalar sector. So yeah, so in four dimensions, well, I'm a bit doubtful because I don't know what graviton scattering is in four dimensions, non-perturbatively, but, uh, but here, yeah, here we really see very clearly this peak, for example, and we see this resonance very sharply with a zero. So for sure, these optimal S matrices do have this, uh, this uh, resonance. But as I said, they have many, many, many resonances. It's just that the number of resonances we can see at a given n, at a given number of parameters is finite because you, basically because a polynomial can only have a finite number of zeros. But, but this one is somehow more narrow than the others. Is there some dominant resonance? Or it's lighter. It's lighter. This it's one is lighter. lighter. Yeah. What, what about in string theory? Like, is there any object that one can, because I know if, if one conjectures that the S matrix you're finding is really the, you know, sits at this also this bottom uh, line of the string theory curve, like, uh, is there any object in string theory that you, you're asking call? Be if it could be some string state? Uh... Uh, for example, I know we have that's well, it's a stronger couple string, it's like intermediate coupling string theory, right? So, but I, I do not know if we know anything about about this regime or oh, I know, or in ideas CFT or something like what are there any any other places where where this guy appears? Not that I know of, yeah. Um, Right, we, we could definitely ask the question, what happens as you move G string continuously from zero to this value, right? So at G string equals zero, we know we have whatever, Virazor Shapiro amplitude with all these sharp resonances. As we, as we turn G, G string, they, they get some width and where do they go? So, so yeah, I guess if you move G string continuously, a natural guess is that the, the first one, the first scalar resonance would move to this point, but we really don't have any, any evidence for that yet. Um, Joe, I have two like uh, naive questions. One is usually I think of resonance as a pole, but you are saying it's a zero. Ah, and yes, yes. Uh, so is like that like, first sheet versus second sheet or something? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. And I, and the other, other wait, question- Wait, could you I explain had, that more? Sorry. I'm also, I feel like there's some, yeah, maybe the, in the context of the plot on the next slide. I, I can explain, uh, let me have here a bit of this. So, so actually this is, uh, this is rigorous if you have a mass gap. So if you have a mass gap, then uh, um, then how does it work? So so this S L of S, I said that the square was uh, less or equal to one. But uh, of course, if you have a mass gap, this S L of S square is actually equal to one for S, well, let's say above four M square and some small, know, nine M square for three particle threshold, right? So if you plot here, you will have a cut in the S plane starting at four M square. And then you have another cut starting at nine M square. And actually you will have a crossed cut in, in these things, you'll have a cross cut from this. So, so the point is just that this, um, you just rewrite this formula. So this formula is valid here above the cut, right? But this is the same, this is the same as SL of S plus I epsilon, S plus I epsilon times SL of S minus I epsilon, because 
well, because the S matrix is also, um, this, uh, these partial waves are also real analytic. So the, the complex conjugate is the same as evaluating at the complex conjugate point. So it means that um, the product of the amplitude above the cut times the amplitude below the cut is one. And so this is an analytic equation now, because you see there's no modulus anymore. And now if you move, if you move, uh, let's say the, the green thing goes below the cut to some pole, then the red thing goes here to a zero. For example, pull in second sheet. Was it clear? No, it was not clear. Yeah. No, yeah, that, that was clear. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And the only so, thing that's not clear to me at this point is why you're plotting the thing that's more like the red thing. The, I'm you plotting something that has a zero here so the you mean in this plot yeah right so then then what happens of course i mean this is also i'm, pl I'm plotting like that but of course there is also a pull on top of this guy right on the first sheet there's also a zero and there is a, another because you can also go under and mm -hmm. there's also a pull on the second sheet below, right? They're symmetric. So what I'm saying is that now if you if you just have you just have a cut and then you have a, a zero nearby, uh, the function will just the phase will rotate by pi, right? You I just see. pass close to a pole, the phase will rotate. And if you plot the phase, it will, I mean, going through pi over two is an indication that you are below the pole. Right? If the, if, sorry, below the zero, sorry. If the zero is very close to the real axis, that's, that's how you identify it. So that's how experimentalists would identify the resonance would be when the phase shift goes to pi over two. Let's see if you have a, I don't know, what, what can I tell you here? But, but you probably actually see the zero on the physical sheet, right? In your raw plane, right? You, yeah, you in that, like, so why actually I, I could have, I don't have it here, but I could have, we didn't put in the paper, but we did do those plots. So in the row plane, yeah, that's a good point. So if I draw, if I draw the row disk, recall that this was S equals zero and S equals infinity here. I really have access to everything here. So I, I do see like a zero here and another zero here, another zero here. So this would be the first resonance where I'm, I'm evaluating. Um, yeah, if I plot, say if I plot here, um, I, if I do, I don't know, contour plot or something of the modulus of S zero of S, then I will see that uh, close to the boundary is almost always close to one, but then inside there are some zeros. So if I do counter plot, it is like that. I don't know if, I don't know if I'm being clear. So I, we do see these zeros and we interpret these zeros as resonances. If you want is given the physical sheet, this is the only definition of resonance, precise definition of resonance that I know of. Yeah. Uh, the second question, Joao, I had was in your experimental plots in the QCD case. Uh, yes. how, how are you making those plots? Because in the real world, uh, pions have a mass and your plot was for massless pions. Yeah. Uh, yes, that's true. But um, yeah, let me think. What I... Yeah, but the the energy, but pions have a mass, but it's still low. You can still have, uh, I guess that's the question. I guess I'm plotting S. So let me think. Yeah, 
Yeah, exactly. So you see, if you see here, So actually, what's on the S? It's it's S, right? I see. So you're saying at high energies, the mass of the pion doesn't matter. Yeah. Now I have to think. I think we plotted, we plotted the energy above the rest mass. Because uh, I agree with you that if it was total S, it should not really start from zero. Let me. I think I have here the paper. I I forgot exactly how we did this match. Yeah, right. For experimental units, we do S minus four over F pi, right? So we compare S in our things with S minus four M pi square. That's how okay. we are comparing. Yes, yes. I see. Otherwise it could not start from zero. Okay, and but that's somehow an okay it, thing to it's do? Not a big, it's a small shift, right? Because you see, M pi is like 100 mev, 90 mev. So this is like a shift of four or I don't know. What. I see. Shift of eight maybe, but then we go up to 200, 100. So it's not, it's just a small, a small mm -hmm. effect in this okay. scale. Okay, thanks. Uh, can I ask a question about pions again? Sure. Uh, so the, in the plot that you have uh, for this, Alpha and beta, I guess I can't, I missed that part. Uh, so you excluded the, the origin. Excluded the white region. The green yeah. region is allowed. And the boundary is a bit, uh, yeah, some parts of the boundary are not completely converged. As you see, they are still moving as you, as we increase N max, but yeah. Yeah, but so it seems that you are getting a scale. Where does it come from? Which you mean? Uh, How do you get a, yeah, where do you get an intercept? No, alpha and beta are both dimensionless. You see, they are defined by the amplitude here. So I, I have S over F pi square and then S square over F pi to the fourth. And alpha and beta are just dimensionless numbers. Yes. So uh, well, the allowed space of these numbers is this green region. The fact that the fact that the the non-trivial curvature of the so you see if I zoom out, that's the inset here, then it almost looks like two straight lines. The fact that the variation happens at this scale of 10 to the minus two, it's, it's expected because that's, uh, I mean, if you just do this naive dimensional analysis, alpha and beta should be of order one over four, four pi square. So four pi all squared, 16 pi squared. Because you see, it's the same type of factors that appear here in the one loop. I don't know if you are, I mean, this naive dimension analysis in phenomenology is a, is a real thing. And some people say it's a, it's a, it's an art. It's not a science, but it's a useful art. I think, I think that's what the, how, how Ricardo describes it. So here we see that indeed it, it did come out a bit the same scale, if, if that's the question. But the, I guess my question is that there is no, I guess I, maybe I missed something. Is there, there is, is there some UV information that fixes this or no? Um, I mean, here the setup is the same. So we say that we study pi pi scattering. We impose this low energy behavior from the effective field theory with alpha uh -huh. and three parameters. And then we say, well, this amplitude has to be embedded into a full amplitude, which is unitary for all partial waves and analytic and crossing symmetric. And uh -huh. we, we run our numerics to, 
well, what we do is minimizing beta for each value of alpha, right? And we obtain this curve by, by running for many values of alpha, the minimum. Oh, okay, so let, let, let me understand. Maybe, maybe this is what you say. You already have some non-trivial non S matrix before alpha and beta. So if I set them to zero, I get a strongly coupled uh, without having anything to save unitarity. Is that basically how I get that? I exclude the origin? Ah, yes, that's why you exclude the origin. Yes, because, uh, because just, uh, just this first term is not compatible with unitarity. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay, okay, now I see, thanks. Well, in that sense, this is really analogous to gravity, right? To, also, zero is also excluded because supergravity by itself already has interaction, so we'll generate some alpha. Uh huh. Okay. Same, same here with this pi living living term in the pi and Lagrangian. So you, you mentioned introducing some um, non-elasticities, right, from black hole or whatever. So, as as you know, yeah. in some other cases where we try to introduce non-elasticity like for flux tubes, doesn't work that simply, right? So, so here somehow you are more optimistic, like for what reason, like this form of an elasticity shouldn't lead to this kind of problems that, okay, you just saturate, you know, whatever elasticity you put in, you just kind of saturate yeah. it. Uh, no, I, uh, think, I think it will, uh, well, uh, here convergence is a bit harder, but yeah, I think in, I expect the same that whatever elasticity I put in the S matrix will go there. So the question I want to understand is if I put a reasonable inelasticity, will that change the value of alpha? Will, because somehow I have lots of absorption at, um, at high energies, does that make alpha, the allowed range of alpha different or not? That's what I wanted to understand. Um, yeah, I suspect I'm not sure if it's related to that, but also maybe related to this and the um, question about linear versus nonlinear unitarity. Would one way to get at this be to like just only implement unitarity for s up to some s max or something and see how your bounds respond? Yeah, that, that won't work. If we just do that, uh, basically, there's no bound. I mean, uh, as so so in in one that one plus one dimensions we can do I mean, if you take identical scalars in one plus one dimension this is just one complex variable problem and we understand it analytically and then it's very clear that if you want to bound anything about the function you need to have the entire boundary of the analytic domain bounded right if there is a some region that you don't bound then the analytic function can do whatever it wants inside and just grows in that in that boundary. So I think if we just impose it up to some S max, we will lose the bound because the, the function will just take advantage of growing at, uh, at that high energy and uh, at, uh, in that range above S max and, uh, and everything will be possible. But we haven't tried for this problem. We could, we could play that game, but I, I think we would lose it, yeah, pretty sure. Okay, yeah, that sounds like a bad idea then. Yeah. <laughs> and we should, uh, yeah, that's our experience. But it's, uh, it's not obvious, in 1D is obvious, we just understand the, the behavior of analytic functions. If, if something is some part of the domain, boundary is not done. Here it's less clear because the analytic function, the boundary of the analytic function and the way we bound it is not the same. We have to move to partial waves. So there is some non-trivial, uh, yeah. The basis where the analyticity is simpler is different from the basis where we impose unitarity. So, so the problem becomes a bit uh, more complicated. Is the behavior, is the large S behavior of your, of like the minimize on the boundary, is the large S behavior, is it just the one that follows from the onsets or does it seem to be like growing slower or something? Yeah. 
Yes, so can I show you? Yeah, so, sorry, no, this is not what I want to know. So the, the question, I mean, I don't know, let's take at this plot as an example, or yeah, for example, this plot. You can, here we stop at pretty low S, right? So suppose you plot this for higher S. What we observe, what, what happens in this type of uh, numerical problem is that the, the curves, as you increase n max, as you increase this n, this cutoff, they will start to converge, but the, the way, the place where convergence happens uh, grows with, um, with S. Okay, so there is a, there is a, a region where this curve and this n equals 23 are go, go together, but then at some value of S, they split. And so there's like an S star of N at which uh, like for S less than S star of N, the curves more or less converged, convergence. So at really high energies for any finite N, as you change from N to N plus one, the curve will change. So we, it's hard to really tell you what is the largest behavior of our ansatz? Because large energy, it's never really very converged. Is that because of more resonances or what, what is the reason? Yes, yes. For example, more resonances, yeah. So we, actually it's even in the massive case that we did uh, whatever in 2017, it's really uh, an open problem. What is the limiting function if you send n to infinity in this numerical procedure that we are doing here? Because <laughs> at any finite s and finite spin, what we see is that the numerical solution tends to saturate better and better the, this unitarity condition. Okay, instead of less being less, it starts to be exactly one. I mean, numerically, right? But it starts to approach one as you increase n. So let me, let me write it like this. We observe that this goes to one as n goes to infinity. If you keep like for fixed, fixed L and S. But it's not a uniform limit. Right. If you if you plot the function for all s, you see that even if you take bigger n at high n, there's always oscillations happening. Things are not converging, hmm. but things get pushed to higher spin and higher energies. So it's unclear what is the limit. It's kind of a very singular function that is going to be this limit, and and we even know that it cannot be uniform because there are theorems of minimal particle production as even reviewed recently by Sasha and Amit here at CERN and their student Miguel Correa that, um, that it's impossible for uh, an interacting amplitude to be completely, to not have particle production. So, so this is, uh, it's an open question. I, I, I don't know it must be a very complicated function the, the actual limit of this don't don't they don't they for the observables that we look at we see good convergence okay, so if you ask about high energy i won't say what it is i don't know the numerics cannot answer but any low energy observable then we can converge it more or less but but you also at low energies i mean saturate this unitarity, elastic unitarity, right? And aren't they like Sasha and Amit and friends, aren't they trying to use it as an argument that uh, your thing does not converge to like a physical S matrix because like it converges to something that violates uh, their theorem? Like what is, what is the status of this that's, discussion? That's, uh, so actually, okay. So into the proof that there must be inelasticity, this proof uses strongly the fact that between four m square and nine m square, you have exact elasticity, right? Not an inequality, but an equality. Yes. Which of course, we also never have in our numerics, right? In our numerics, we see 
this as a limit, but we never see it exactly one. And therefore, Sasha and Amit will say that these are not good amplitudes because they don't obey this property of exact elastic unitarity. But uh, I think about the limits, nobody knows. So. Well, but it's a little bit different than as a for opinions because you probably get something that's very close, like between 4m squared and 9m squared, you get something very close to what they want. And like above nine and squared, like you get some order one different from what they want or whatever. And then if you go, you know, to 15 M squared, like is it how like they have some minimal bound on non-elasticity non at, I don't know, 20 M squared or something. They have right? it, it's still asymptotic, right? They don't have mm -hmm. a bound on non-elasticity. They don't have a lower bound on inelasticity at fixed L and fixed S. I, and it, uh, what, uh, like, could you remind like what the bound is on what on some it's like a, a large tail that, tail that uh, ah, it's, 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 it's at large I see it's some, something else is taken large uh -huh. yeah. so it's an asymptotic bound so it's hard to use so what about this uh, I mean I, I, I didn't follow like which kind of analyticity you actually use all this discussions of anomalous thresholds and you know like where where you can actually assume analyticity where you cannot like what what is uh, like your results where do they stand as far as so as so concerned? here I, I use uh, all of it I use okay. uh, it's really analytic in the product of the right if we take the disks right you take three disks tensor product of the three disks st and u uh -huh. or S, T, and U, and then just take the surface S equals T equals U, S plus T plus U equals zero. That intersects that. So that's that's what uh, that's the inelasticity you would get in every order in perturbation theory for uh, for a massive particle. And well, I guess you can take the massless limit. I don't see any problem. Is that is that you you can see yeah, that what, what is of misera, right? Yeah, like what is I mean, what what Witten was asking you at Princeton basically is. Uh, yeah, but now he's happy working, with what you said. Uh, he's working on that with uh, Sebastian Misera, right? And the, he already put a paper explaining, like we revisiting these results. Uh, well, but more from the perturbative point of view, that uh, you can see, like it's clearly stated in his paper now that lowest, if you have a massive in, in particle Se in, Se in Sebastian's in Sebastian's paper. Yeah, two to two scattering of the lightest uh, massive particle does not have any anomalous thresholds, is analytic everywhere. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. So we are, mm -hmm. we are using that uh, the biggest analyticity compatible with perturbation theory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That, yeah, it's not, uh, it's not proven. Yeah, I'm not sure how much of this is really necessary to prove these bounds. But so, for example, this dual some of these dual methods use less analyticity. Um, so it would be interesting to see if they get a weaker bound or not. It's unclear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, are there other questions? I still, do we still have people resisting? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is, there is, that's usually how it works. I mean, there is some tail of... <laughs> yeah, maybe what we can do is we can stop the official recording. Thanks, Joao, once more. And if there is a further okay. tale of people, we can stick around. Thanks, Joao. Thanks, sure, thanks a lot.